Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from south of Jerusalem in the holy and beautiful pastoral land of Israel. Today is the 10th day of the month of Tammuz, 5784. It's July 16th, 2024. This coming Shabbat, we are reading the Parshat Balak in the book of Numbers, beginning with chapter 22, verse 2, concluding with chapter 25, 25, verse 9. One week from today, the 17th of Tammuz, is the fast of Tammuz, Shva Esreba Tammuz, as we say in Hebrew. It is a dawn to dark fast. It marks the breaching of the walls of Jerusalem during the Second Temple period, which led up to the destruction of the Second Holy Temple on the 9th of Av. And as we posted earlier this week, the walls of the of Jerusalem uh, during the First Temple period, the temple that King Solomon built, were breached on the 9th of Tammuz. And um, that day, which that also led up to uh, the destruction of the First uh, Holy Temple, uh, uh, which was destroyed by not by the Romans but by the Babylonians, of course. And uh, that day, the ninth, was a fast day, uh, commemorating uh, the history uh, and destruction of the first Holy Temple um, throughout the Second Temple period. But uh, when uh, the seventeenth became the day of the destruction of the, the breaching of the walls that led to the destruction of the Second Temple. Uh, a decision was made to combine the fast to a single fast day, um, unfortunately commemorating the beginning of the destruction of both holy temples. And of course, as we know, the 17th of Tammuz uh, begins a three-week period, uh, which known as Bain Ametzarim, between the straits, which is actually uh, uh, taken from a verse in the book of uh, Echa, Lamentations, a book written by the prophet Jeremiah, which describes the uh, destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Um, and um, where was I? Someone just messaged me something and it totally distracted me. Um, yes. The seventeenth of Tammuz leads the beginning of three weeks of of, of mourning. We uh, take on uh, aspects of traditional mourning, um, although when we traditionally mourn uh, the loss of a loved one, uh, we start out with the the, the shiva. First, the 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 lavaya, the the burial, the funeral procession, and then uh, seven days of shiva of intense uh, uh, mourning, and then a month uh, called the Shloshim, 30 days, in which um, slightly less intense, and then there's a year uh, throughout which the mourners say the Kaddish prayer, and um, refrain from, throughout that entire year, refrain from uh, going out to parties or celebrations or, or musical uh, events. Uh, it's a, day, a year of of um, keeping low, um, out of respect for uh, the person who passed on. The but as we see, it's a year that the the mourning process gets lighter and lighter as as time goes along, it goes from very intense to much less intense. And uh, but during the three weeks, it's actually the opposite because we, during the three weeks, many people refrain from also going to, to entertainment, uh, doing uh, frivolous things, lighthearted things, um, and beginning with uh, the first day of Av uh, next month, uh, people intensify their, um, what, they, what they refrain from doing. Um, there's all different customs, and everyone uh, follows Different people follow different customs, but of course the final culmination, which is the the height, let's say, of the three weeks, is Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, which is a 25-hour fast um, and um, very intense day. 
So, as I said, next Tuesday, one week from today, we will be beginning that period of three weeks, Bena Meitzarim, unless, of course, uh, we make some dramatic progress uh, in the meantime uh, with the building of the Beit HaMikdash, with the building of the Holy Temple, because once we have built the Holy Temple, or I would even say begun building the Holy Temple, um, then uh, there's no more fasting for the destruction of the Holy Temple. So that is what we're all looking forward to. That's what we're aiming at. That's what the Temple Institute is all about. You know, we recently, just um, one week ago actually, we filmed at the Temple Institute. Um, we are putting together right now a, a video that we'll be showing uh, sometime uh, during the three weeks, probably on uh, Rosh Chodesh Av. And it basically is going to introduce you to the people at Machon Mikdash, people at the Temple Institute, who they are, what they do. You know, we present our activities, we present our, we share our knowledge, our research, uh, the beautiful paintings that we have uh, all the time. And so, if you are a follower of the Temple Institute on uh, social media, then you are well aware of the many things that we do, but you're not so aware of who's doing it. And so we felt it would the time had come to introduce you to uh, many of the people, many of the people behind the scenes at the Temple Institute who make the magic happen. And hopefully, it's going to be much more than magic. Hopefully, we are really. Um, Hopefully we're pioneers and are helping with many other, with everyone, everyone who, who wants the Mikdash, everyone who wants the Holy Temple. We're all working, everybody in all different ways toward getting there. And hopefully uh, what we're doing at the Temple Institute uh, has made a difference and will continue to make a difference and hopefully will make a big, big difference um, that uh, we will all uh, be grateful for. So, like I said, that video will be coming out in about two weeks, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, it was a wonderful day of filming, and again, giving not only giving uh, you, our viewers, a chance to see and hear from the people behind the scenes, but also giving those people behind the scenes a chance to, to uh, be seen and heard. Uh, they work very hard. They are very dedicated. This is what they. This is their love of their lives. This is what they do. This is what they're working for. This is what they're living for, for advancing our knowledge of the Holy Temple, for advancing our knowledge of the commandments uh, that we need to perform and perfect in order to get to the Holy Temple and to and to perform the ceremonies in the Holy Temple. And of course, everything, everything needed, necessary for building the Holy Temple. We, um, day and night, uh, the people that you'll be seeing in the video, that's what they're working on. That's what they're focused on. We posted today, just today, on our Facebook page, uh, a link to a video that Beryl Solomon uh, just. Uh, uh, uploaded to YouTube. Beryl Solomon, as you may know, is a very popular uh, uh, Jewish influencer. He is uh, connected with Chabad. He is a very interesting person, very interesting story, and um, and he's also very good at telling a story. And he produced a full length. By full length, I mean, well, let's see, how long is it? Let's one moment. I'm going to in just a moment by full length I mean hold on uh, over an hour an hour and seven minute video um, called uh, searching for the Jewish Messiah and um, he goes on a search throughout the United States and then makes his way to Israel and at uh, I can tell you exactly at at um, exactly, oh, just hold on a moment. 
at exactly 49 minutes and 26 seconds, he uh, arrives at the Temple Institute, where he has the uh, great pleasure, or I should say I had the great pleasure of meeting with him and um, showing him around the Temple Institute. And uh, it's a very, very, very fascinating video. He meets with some fantastic people. I'm very flattered that I am one of those people. But uh, I think you'll recognize uh, some of the other people that he meets with. And it's well worth watching from beginning to end. Um, really a great video, and it was a lot of fun uh, working with him uh, when he was at the Temple Institute. So um, I highly recommend that you have a look at that video. You can, again, find it on our Facebook page. We have a link to it, or go to Beryl Solomon on YouTube, and you'll find it there as well. Uh, it's been up for less than a day. Think about, uh, oh, let's see. I'm just going to double check again. I'm sorry. Uh, it's been um, up for uh, about 14 hours, and it has close to 42,000 views. And I'm sure it will get many, many more. Um, very, very well done, uh, and very, very and encouraging, let's say. Um, everybody, everybody who's interviewed uh, says we're getting closer and closer any minute now. So let's hope, let's pray, and let's work toward it. Um, the news, well, as you know, Israel, this past Shabbat, took out Mohammed Def, the number two uh, the number two evil person in the Hamas terror organization, someone who had uh, escaped seven previous assassination attempts, and so he had become quite legendary, and he sort of was a symbol for the followers of Hamas, of you know how they are going to survive and, and continue, and he has been eliminated. Now, Hamas has not admitted that he's been eliminated, um, and the but the explosion, Israel uh, had been tracking him, and he actually had come up from the tunnels, which is where he has been hiding uh, for many many months. And the fact that he came up from the tunnels was also a sign that uh, Israel is really closing in on Hamas all throughout the the uh, Gaza, because it's no longer so easy for them to move around inside the tunnels. Many have been destroyed. He came out, Israel's been tracking him, and probably got inside information from someone who Israel has captured and uh, interrogated, and that's another good sign because it means that uh, people in Aza, maybe even Hamas, is beginning to turn on its own. And. Um, Anyway, it was a huge, massive explosion, uh, a bunker bomb, because he was, they wanted to make sure he would not be able to escape underground. And uh, when you look at the explosion itself and the aftermath, it's hard to believe that he could have possibly escaped death. Um, he and a number of other uh, Hamas terrorists, including some other high-ranking terrorists, were destroyed in this attack. And um, that brings Israel one step closer to uh, a victory. Again, I don't think that um, I don't. I mean, Israel will be in Gaza, I hope, permanently. But certainly, the army is going to be very active for many months to come. Because even after uh, Hamas has been uh, destroyed, there will still be many uh, much terror to to deal with. Anyway, that's very good news. The other very good news this week, of course, was the narrow uh, escape, escape, the narrow miss by the assassin's bullet on the President Trump. And Baruch Hashem, uh, he missed. A lot of people are saying it was an act of God. That uh, I mean, we all saw, we all saw how he turned his head and how the bullet whizzed by, w and clipped his ear, obviously you can't get closer than that. Uh, and of course his response, which was wow, no, simply wow. Um, nobody can deny that it was wow, that he got back up 
and uh, pumped his fist. And that was a huge, huge message, not only to his supporters, of course, but to the world. Um, quite frankly, there are two candidates. One is, quite unfortunately, uh, going senile. He's having a hard time putting sentences together, keeping his thoughts together. The idea that he uh, could be elected for another term is terrifying because I don't believe he's making decisions now. And obviously, if he's not making decisions, then and it's, it's not democracy because the person that you voted for is not the... Uh, is not the person who's making the decisions, of course, and he's not going to last another four years one way or another, and that, you know, who that means becomes president if he uh, is re-elected. Um, and, of course, even if he is totally cognitive, his, his, his policies have been disastrous. Um, I can't speak firsthand for his domestic policies. I don't live in America, so I will stay out of that, but I certainly know that his... Uh, foreign policy has been disastrous for many people around the world and especially here in the Middle East and especially here in Israel. Israel has, you know, we played a big part in in all the mess-ups and stupidity that led to October 7th, but the United States played a major, major, major role and continues to. You know, he just was interviewed and he started out by saying he's a Zionist, and then he went on to say how much he's helping the Palestinians in Gaza. Who are the Palestinians in Gaza? Hamas. So, yeah, he's he's not my... He is not my uh, candidate of choice. I'm saying that, and, uh, of course, uh, very beautiful at the Republican convention, this moment of silence for the hostages. Um, I mean, you know, it didn't didn't take too much to do that, but what a gesture, and I, I can't imagine a, a similar gesture coming from the Democratic Convention, and it was very, I'm telling you, it was very, very meaningful to people here in Israel, um, that, uh, and, and of course, I know that the Republican Party has been very, very, very outspoken and active concerning the rampant, uh, vile anti-Semitism in America, and also in support of Israel here. And uh, I also heard uh, uh, the speech uh, by uh, the vice president uh, uh, nominee, uh, J.D. Vance, and uh, I like his foreign policy positions uh, concerning Israel and the Middle East, concerning Iran, and uh, yeah. Um, those are the guys that I, that I want um, handling American foreign policy uh, throughout the world because there's nothing, everything's connected. And certainly the people handling the foreign policy now have created a huge, huge mess. And we are, if we're not there already, we are just, uh, you know, like uh, rolling out of control downhill toward World War III. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully there'll be some. Uh, a moment of sanity and clarity in America and uh, people in just a few months will make the right choice. Uh, let's talk about Parshat Balak and it is a unique Parsha because it tells a story of a heathen prophet by the name of Bilam. That's how we say his name in Hebrew, Bilam. And uh, he was a heathen prophet but uh, uh, God spoke to him, and he was considered to be a prophet uh, every bit as connected, as powerful as Moshe. But of course, Moshe was a prophet for good, and uh, Bilam was basically a, a prophet for hire, or a prophet for profit, you might want to say. Um, he was a freelancer, it seems. He took on jobs. You know, I also posted earlier this week on our Facebook page uh, about the very fascinating archaeological discovery that was actually made in 1967 in Jordan, uh, an inscription written on a, a wall of an ancient ruin. They are dating it to the 9th century, I believe, uh, BCE, and it 
it has a number of verses, a number of lines, and it talks about a prophet named Bilam, a very popular prophet, it seems. And as you read the description, and again, we have the description, uh, it's part of the post on our Facebook page, and to translate it into English, so it was originally written in a, uh, an Aramaic uh, dialect. And it's the same, it's the same Bilam. It's the same Bilam. There's no question about it. You recognize this person. Uh, now he is, his, this little story being told about him uh, uh, that we have the access to, because it's only a part of obviously much longer story, um, of course uh, deals with him from a different perspective. It deals with him from the perspective of the locals who lived in that area. And uh, they he was a prophet that talked to their gods. Um, so it's very interesting uh, historically what this all means, but we certainly means that, wow, this guy Bilam, he was a superstar of his day. And uh, even though the story uh, that we're reading in our parsha took place centuries before the ninth century BCE, he obviously uh, was renowned. He was a he was a star in his day. He was a, a, a celebrity, an icon, very popular. And um, yeah, he was a heathen prophet. He apparently would. Uh, communicate with what you know you name the god you want him to get in touch with and, and he could do it um so it's very very fascinating uh to read and, and if you look up uh bilam and uh i think let me just double check the the actual place where this was found was in a place called um a place called I don't find it right here, but um, if you look look at Bilam and archaeology, you can find a number of articles really fascinating written about it. Um, and it just, you know, it's almost like a, another commentary to our, our parsha, to our story about Bilam, because it just seems to fill in or adds a lot of color. And again, you can see why Balak, at the beginning of our parsha, which we're going to read in just a moment, why he turned to him. He was he was the, the obvious choice. He wanted to curse Israel, as we know. We read last week in in Parshat uh, Hukat. Um, toward the end of the parsha, we read about the the military victories of Israel, which brought Israel all the way to the um, to the Jordan River, basically all the way to east of of Canaan. Uh, and then the hills, the mountains of Moab, uh, which is part of the uh, kingdom of Jordan today. And Balak was there, and he was terrified because he saw that Israel was being victorious. Now, again, you know, last week we read about how Israel would turn to these nations. Moshe would send messengers and say, we just want to get to the other side of your territory. Uh, if you allow us to peacefully walk through, we have our own provisions, we're not going to take from your orchards or your fields. We're not going to take from your wells. We are well provisioned. And uh, we just want to peacefully march through. And everyone they turned to said no. Um, even then, it seems, even then, it seems that Israel was not so popular among the nations. Uh, that would have been such an easy, wonderful gesture. Even, even they approached Edom. Of course, Edom were the descendants of Esau, the brother of Yaakov, and they said, you know, cousins, let us go through, and Edom said no. So Israel, in the case of Edom, did not go to war against Edom because we're brothers, we're cousins, uh, took a long, circuitous route to avoid them, but the other nations Israel did go to war with and conquered them. And so Balak is quite justifiably terrified. And let's read the first few verses from Parshat Balak. And the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verse 2, Vayar Balak ben Sipor et kol asher asa Yisrael le'emori. Vayagor Moav mipne ha'am ma'od ki rav hu. Vayakots Moav mipne bnei Yisrael. Vayomer Moav el zikne midian ata yalachahu 
הקהל את כל סביבותינו, כי לחוך השור את ירק השדה, ובלק בן ציפור מלך למואב בעת ההיא. וישלח מלאכים אל בלעם בן באור פטורה, אשר על הנהר ארץ בני עמו, לקרוא לו לאמור, הנה עם יצא ממצרים, הנה כיסה את עין הארץ, והוא יושב ממולי. ואתה לך נא, ארא לי את העם הזה, כי עצום הוא ממני, אולי אוכל נקה בו, ואגרשנו מן הארץ, כי ידעתי את אשר תברך מבורך, ואשר תואר יואר. בלק, son of Tzipor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorite. Moab became very frightened of the people because it was numerous and Moab was disgusted in the face of the children of Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, now that the congregation will lick up our entire surroundings as an ox licks up the greenery of the field. Balak son of Sipor was king of Moab at that time. He sent messengers to Bilam son of Baor to Petor, which is by the river of the land of the members of his people, to summon him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. Behold, it has covered the surface of the earth, and it sits opposite me. So now, please come and curse this people for me, for it is too powerful for me. Perhaps I will be able to strike it and drive it away from the land, for I know that whomever you bless is blessed, and whomever you curse is cursed. So there you have it. That's the introduction to the story of Bilam. Whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever is cursed is, you curse is cursed. Does that ring a bell? Yes, of course it does. That was when Avraham had promised that Hashem said to Avraham, when he invited Avraham into Canaan, and he said, you'll be a great nation, and all the nations of the world will be blessed through you, and the nations, whoever blesses you will be blessed, and whoever curses you will be cursed. Well, this gets turned on its head here, and um, because apparently... It would seem that Bilam really did have the power to to uh, curse and make a meaningful curse that would have ramifications or bless. And so, uh, of course, to make a long story short, he tells the people, the messengers that Balak sent to him, I got to consult with God, and apparently uh, God only spoke to him at night. And so he slept on it, and uh, the next morning said, God said not to do it. This is, a, this is a blessed people. You can't curse these people. And they came back and uh, with a negative response, and Balak sent him again and again. And finally, I think it was the third time, uh, God said to Bilam, go with them, but you're going to only say what I tell you to say. So he saddles his she-donkey, uh, a ton in Hebrew, and starts off for Moab. And, of course, we have that fantastical story about uh, him riding on his, on his she-ass, and the she-ass sees an angel of Hashem on the way and, of course, moves to the side, and that angers Bilam, and this happens a number of times, and even at one time he moves against the wall uh, when, he sees, when she sees the angel and that... Uh, uh, causes uh, Bilam's uh, foot to, to get uh, uh, injured and he gets very, very mad and he starts beating his donkey and his donkey opens his mouth and, and opens her mouth and says, what have I done to you? And of course this is, wow, speaking donkey, there are actually two animals in the, in the five books in the Torah that speak and of course the first one is the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Um, and there's all different opinions, rabbinic opinions of did he actually speak words, uh, how did that happen, but in this case, um, Donkey opened her mouth and spoke, and spoke very intelligently and really made, pardon the, pardon the pun in advance, really made an ass out of Bilam, who just looked so stupid. You know, this lowly Donkey is seeing this angel that Bilam doesn't. Finally, of course, uh, the angel uh, appears, opens Bilam's eyes, and, and, and Bilam sees the angel and realizes the error of his ways. Um, 
And it's a very interesting story also because God told him to go but only say what I told you to say, but then God's angry because he's going. Uh, God seems to be playing mind games with Bilaam um, and uh, sort of like really setting him up. So, but of course, after this incident, he continues and then meets up with Balak and there they set out to curse Israel and Bilam, you know, he has a caveat. He says to Balak, I gotta tell you ahead of time, I can only say what Hashem puts in my mouth. So I'll do my best. But you can't, you know, it was a, you know, it's like you sign a statement. Uh, there's a name for it. You probably know what I'm trying to say. I can't think of it right now. That, um, you know, you won't hold the person responsible for lack of results. Anyway, they went from mountaintop to mountaintop where they could see the in, the entire uh, encampment of Israel, the tents spread out in the in the plains. And, of course, every time that Bilam did open his mouth, what came out were words of praise and blessing for Israel. Some of the most beautiful, beautiful words, beautiful prophecies about Israel spoken in the entire Torah. And so beautiful that uh, some of them are even have made it to the our daily prayer and of course I'm referring to how how beautiful are your tents O Israel how does that go exactly let me just look it up uh, how goodly are your tents O Yaakov of your dwelling places O Israel right that is chapter 24 verse 5 and then you continue stretching out like brooks like gardens by a river like aloes planted by a shem like cedars by water and of course every time when he praises and blesses Israel he uh, Balak is very very upset with him and eventually ultimately after they've decided they're going to go their own way and like they're finished you know um, and Balak uh, accepts that uh, the last thing he wants him to do is to bless Israel again so he says okay you go home and then Bilam prophesizes one more time and of course this is his prophecy of the distant future uh, and uh, of what's going to happen in the final days which you know what let's read it because uh, chances are it's super relevant to where we are right now in history so let's uh, let's just go over it really quickly the words of Bil'am this is uh, verse uh, 15, 20, chapter 24. The words of Bilam, son of Baor, the words of the man with the open eye, the words of one who hears the sayings of God and who knows the, sh the knowledge of the Supreme One, who sees the vision of Shaddai while fallen and with uncovered eyes. I shall see him, but not now. I shall look at him, but it is not near. A star has issued from Yaakov, and a, sh a scepter bearer has risen from Israel, and he shall pierce the nobles of Moab and undermine the children of Sheth. Edom shall be as a conquest, and Seir shall be as the conquest of his enemies, and Israel will attain success. One from Yaakov shall rule and destroy the remnant of the city. He saw Amalek and claimed his parable and said, Amalek is the first among nations, but its end will be eternal destruction. And he saw the Kenite and claimed his parable and said, Strong is your dwelling, and set in the rock is your nest. For if the Kenite should be laid waste, till where can Assyria take you captive? He declaimed his parable and said, Oh, who will survive when he imposes these? Big ships from the coast of Kitim will afflict Assyria and afflict the other bank, but it too will be destroyed forever. Then Bilam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went on his way. So, you know what? We're, we are in a time where, uh, you know, we're looking around and prophecy after prophecy just has, we see him being fulfilled I would say for the past 150 years, it's been a period of of prophecy fulfillment uh, for Israel and the world. And uh, thank God we've made it to this point. Let's keep pushing on. Let's keep doing what we need to do so we can get to that finish finish line and uh, make it to a better a better world, the world of the Holy Temple, the world of peace or the brotherhood. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.